Praise the Lord, this is Andrew Womack, and today I want to start sharing a uh, subject that I have been praying about and working towards for many, many, many years. I have a brand new series out entitled, You've Already Got It, So Quit Trying to Get It. This is the first tape in that series. It's a six-tape series. And actually, the revelation here that I'm trying to communicate is something that God gave to me uh, decades ago. And I've shared it and expressed it uh, on many different occasions, but I've done it like uh, in passing. I'll be teaching on the subject of healing, and healing will be the teaching. And yet in passing, I'll just talk about how that healing is already a done deal. And then I'll talk about prosperity, and in the subject is prosperity. And on the way, I'll talk about how God has already commanded the blessing. But I've never just focused on this thing that it's already done. I have felt in the past that I've tried to communicate this, but yet my experience is that I'll teach along these lines, tell people that they've already got everything, God's already blessed them, it's a done deal, and they'll come up right after I preach on them, preach my heart out, and they'll say something like, well, would you pray with me that God will just bless me? Would you pray that God would touch me? I need God to come and touch me and heal my body. And they say things that violate everything I taught, and so... Over the years, I've just come to realize that even though this is a revelation to me, I haven't uh, expressed it in a way that people are getting it. And so for the last, I'd say at least three years, very earnestly, maybe five years, I've been praying about that God would just give me a way of making this clear. Now, people still have the uh, freedom to accept or reject, I understand that, but I mean, they ought to at least get my point, and I've been praying that God would help me, and I've been praying about it. I've already had a cover design for years, which is uh, on the front of this album. You know, it's got a dog chasing its tail, and it's got this tail in its mouth, and it realizes it already had it. You know, it was chasing something it already had, and so I've had this design. I've had the uh, concept. I've had the revelation, and yet I've just been frustrated trying to get it across, and this is what this entire album is about, and I really believe that this is foundational. I can tell you in my own life that if I was to put things into priority, this would be probably second or third out of all of the things that God has ever shown me that are foundational truths that I draw from on a constant basis. I mean, this is at nearly at the top of the heap, so I believe that it's that important. I believe that if you will listen and receive what I'm saying in this series, that it will impact your life that way. If, for some reason, you listen to this series and it doesn't seem to impact you and change your way of thinking and just provide you with a brand new direction that, I mean, quickens faith and encourages you, and you know that you are going to see a much greater manifestation of God's power and victory in your life as a result of this. If that is not the result of you listening to this tape album, well, then I encourage you to listen to it again and pray because I really believe it's all there. I will say this, that this teaching that I'm giving has to come by revelation. By that, I mean that you can't just listen to it intellectually and get this. The Holy Spirit of God has to quicken this truth to you. And I I really believe that. I mean, that's the way that it came to me. You know, if I was teaching on the subject of healing, I could take scriptures on healing, and I could take a person that, say, for instance, didn't believe that it was God's will to heal people today, and I could intellectually back them into a corner with scripture if they say that they believe that the Bible is the truth, the Word of God, then I could take the Word of God and I could paint them into a corner to where they would intellectually have to say, well, yes, that's what the Bible says. Now, they may choose not to believe it, but they would have to acknowledge that I see what you're saying. I don't believe it's that way. I choose not to believe it for whatever reason. Everybody has that freedom. But I could make a person see my point. If it comes on the subject of prosperity, I could do the same thing. I could make a person see my point. And on and on with so many scriptural truths. But this truth about how that everything is already a done deal, and it's complete, and that we aren't uh, trying to work towards a victory, we're coming from a victory. Those kind of revelations, I cannot make a person believe that. I mean, it's this is different. It's like it's on a different level. It's a different depth. 
And uh, I cannot convince anybody and make them see this. It has to come by revelation. So my purpose in saying that is that I believe that the revelation is here in these in these tapes, in this album. And I can testify that it's changed my life and the lives of thousands of people. And if for some reason it doesn't have that impact on you, I don't believe that it's because the revelation is lacking, but it just has to be quickened to you by the Holy Spirit. So before we even start this, I'm praying in the name of Jesus that God would open up the eyes of your understanding and mine and help us to see what he's done for us and give us a revelation of this, that, Father, we we want supernatural revelation. We ask you to help us to hear with our heart, to see with our heart, and go beyond that. Father, all of the distractions that could come to people as they listen to this tape set that could interrupt and cause them not to make the connection and put all of these things together, I'm asking you that... You would just somehow or another separate us and put us in a position where we will receive this truth. And, Father, I believe that you are doing that for people, and I just thank you for it, and we agree and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me just start over in the book of Ephesians. And by way of introduction, let me say that the book of Ephesians is written with this paradigm or with this attitude that we're talking about, how everything is already accomplished in Christ. Most Christians don't live their life that way. Most Christians spend their entire life asking the Lord to heal them, to deliver them, to bless them, to prosper them. They're always seeking God to do something. They believe that God can do anything, but they don't believe that he has, past tense, done very much. You'll hear many of the prophecies in the body of Christ talking about God is going to do something. And you'll find out that much of the prophecy is all about future tense things. And yet it's never about what God has already done. I can't say never, but I'm saying that the predominant way that you hear prophecies and words of encouragement come in the body of Christ, it's all about what God is going to do, not about what he has done. And yet the book of Ephesians is written from the exact opposite perspective. It's about what God has already done. I really believe that the true victorious Christian is not seeking victory, but rather is enforcing the victory that has already been purchased for them through Christ. We aren't trying to win a battle. We are coming from a battle that has already been won for us. We are more than conquerors through Christ. We aren't trying to get healed, but we are fighting because we have already been healed, and Satan is trying to steal from us what is rightfully ours. We aren't asking God to bless us and prosper us financially, but God has already commanded a blessing on us, and what we're doing is fighting a good fight of faith to get rid of our stinking thinking, our poverty mentality, to start believing that we're blessed, start acting like we're blessed, talking like it. And as we do these things, we just appropriate what God has already provided for us. Now, the benefits of this are tremendous, and I'm going to be dealing with this in this six-tape set in a lot more detail, but here's just kind of an an overview of some of the things that we're going to talk about. If you can understand that you've already been blessed, you've already had everything provided, then it takes this legalistic performance mentality away from, And you don't struggle as much with legalism and coming under condemnation and feeling unworthy because you recognize that everything has already been provided. It was provided before you ever came along. It was provided independent of your worth or value, uh, any worthiness on your part. It's a gift. And if you understand that it's already provided, how can you doubt that God will give you what he's already given you? It takes this thing about, oh, God, I know you can do it, but will you do it for me? It eliminates that because he's already done it. I really believe that this is just tremendous. It has revolutionized my life. And I also will tell you this, it will ruin you. If you start understanding and seeing what I'm saying, it is going to ruin you from uh, a lot of what is called Christianity today. So much of what is going on in the body of Christ looks good on the surface because it's proclaiming God can do this. God can heal, deliver, prosper, set you free, uh, make you happy and joyful. And it all sounds good, but they aren't believing that it has been done. They're just professing that it can happen. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the scripture there says, 
that uh, without faith it's impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. They have to believe that God is, present tense, not that God was, not that he's the great I was or the great I am going to be, but that he is the great I am, that God has already done it, present tense, you have it, and that he rewards us for diligently seeking him. That's what faith is. And yet, in Christianity today, it's been subtly veiled in something that appears faith to a lot of people. But the truth is, most people don't believe that God has blessed them, that God has done anything. They believe it can happen. It's off in the future, and they are are working towards it. But see, that's not faith. Faith isn't believing that God can do something. It's believing that he has done something. I even saw a little plaque that said, Faith is not believing that God can, but that God will. Well, I want to go a step further than that and say faith is not believing that God can or will, but that he has already done it. You know, in an effort to get this point across, uh, as I said, I've been frustrated because I'll preach my heart out and it's obvious that people didn't get what I was saying. And it's just like this is such a reversal of thinking that I've been frustrated. And so I've resorted to tricks. I've resorted to all kinds of things. I remember a meeting that I held in West Virginia that uh, the pastor and his people had gotten up and had been singing these songs about I'm desperate for you. And I love that song. I really do. I mean, it's a, I like the tune and I like the message if I interpret it. But you know what? Technically speaking, when you say the word desperate, let me just share with you. And and please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I think there's a lot of good in that song. I still sing that song, but instead where it says, I'm desperate for you, I just put in there, I'm in love with you. And uh, anyway, I express my love. And I believe that a person can mean that when they say the word desperate. But let me share, share with you what the word desperate means according to the dictionary. Here's the dictionary definition of the word desperate. It means reckless or violent because of despair, driven to take any risk. I think that there's six definitions here, and every one of them will somehow or another mention despair in some way. So the first definition is reckless or violent because of despair, driven to take any risk. The second definition is undertaken as a last resort. The third definition, nearly hopeless, critical, grave, a desperate illness. Notice the word hopeless in that definition. The number four definition, marked by arising from or showing despair, despairing, the desperate look of hunger. The fifth definition, in an unbearable situation because of need or anxiety, desperate for recognition. Number six, extreme because of fear, danger, or suffering, very great, in desperate need. And it comes from the word, uh, the Latin word means to uh, despair. The synonyms for despair are hopelessness, desperation, despondency, depression, discouragement, dejection. All of these nouns denote emotional states marked by lowness of spirits or loss of hope. Despair and hopelessness stress the utter absence of hope and often imply a sense of powerlessness or resignation. Desperation implies absence of grounds for hope, but adds the idea of fighting back, often blindly or recklessly. Now, the reason I'm saying all of this is because, again, we sing these songs, Lord, I'm desperate for you. If you mean that in the sense that you're saying, God, I just love you, and I want you more than anything else, if that's what you use for the definition of desperate, Well, then that's okay. But if you use a dictionary definition, any of the dictionary definitions that I've read, reckless or violent because I'm in despair, I'm hopeless, it's critical. God, I'm I'm, uh, desperate. I'm, uh, what are some of these other definitions? Uh, Extreme, uh, without hope. There's no grounds for hope, but I'm fighting back anyway. If that's what you're meaning by you're desperate for the Lord, that's absolutely wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Hopelessness, helplessness, despair should not be the condition of a believer. If you understand the things that I'm going to be presenting on this series about how it's already done, how God already loves you, how he's already blessed you with everything, it's a done deal, then why are you desperate if it's already done? 
The only reason a Christian can be desperate, according to the dictionary definition, not necessarily the connotation that a lot of people put with it, but the dictionary definition is if you do not understand that God has already blessed you, that God already loves you, that nothing will ever change this. If you don't know your position and what you have in Christ, that's the only reason for despair. Despair, hopelessness in the Christian life, is an indication of a person that doesn't know what they have. They don't have a full revelation of what Jesus has done for them. Now, I'm not saying that Christians who have a full revelation of what Jesus has done for them don't ever have problems, but I'm saying in the midst of that problem, they just, you know, know that, well, God, I know that you've already got a supply for this need before I've got the need, and I know it's there, and so I'm just drawing closer to you, I'm seeking you, and I'm asking for revelation, and they don't have hopelessness and despair. Also, the word hunger, according to the dictionary, if you use the word hunger to express desire, well, then that's good. When you say, I'm hungry for you, God, I desire you, I love you more than anything else, that's good. But hunger also means the hurt, the pain, the agony, the depression, the despair that goes along with not having your needs met. And you know what? I believe that when a lot of people sing these songs about, I'm hungry for you, I'm desperate for you, they aren't using those words in the best sense of the thing, but they are. it's like a Christian blues song. They are saying, oh, God, Christian life, I'm so miserable. God, it's so terrible. Oh, God, but I'm looking for you. You're my answer, and I believe that out there somewhere you are going to do something. If that's your attitude, you have missed this revelation that I'm trying to get across. So anyway, this church that I was talking about had just sung these songs, and uh about I'm hungry for you, I'm desperate for you, and singing these things about, oh, God, we need a move. Oh, God, touch us. Oh, God, do something. And they'd just been singing all of these songs. And so I got up, and I said, how many of you are hungry for the Lord? And everybody, yay, even the pastor stood up, and they all clapped and cheered. I said, how many of you are desperate for the Lord? And they all said, yay, and they clapped and cheered. Then I said, let's turn over to John chapter 6, verse 35. And that verse says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And I said, What's wrong with this picture? All of you just stood and said that you're hungry, you're thirsty, and this says you will never hunger, you will never thirst. Jesus said basically the same thing to the woman at the well in the fourth chapter of the book of John. And he said in verse 14, he says, Whosoever drinketh of this water, that of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I use the term about getting hungry for God. And, and I use it in the sense that we're talking about that you've got to desire God. Matter of fact, a very good friend of mine, Bob Nichols, uh, he has done a lot of ministry, and one of his phrases that I've borrowed and that I use a lot is, he says, as long as you can live without more of God, you will. Or as long as you can live without more healing, you will, or whatever. And the point that he's stressing is that you've got to get to where you are hungry for the things of God in the sense that you are focused, that you are seeking with all of your heart. The Bible says over in I, Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 13, you know, that uh, he knows the thoughts that he has towards us, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give us an expected end. And he, then he says, and then you shall seek me and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. One of the truths of Scripture is that the Lord doesn't come to those who just would like a touch and passively desire the things of God. you got to be hungry. you got to desire it with all of your heart. I subscribe to that type of hunger. But if you're talking about, oh, God, I'm just so empty. Oh, God, I have no joy. I have no peace. I'm hungry. I'm desperate for you. That is not right. And yet that is being proclaimed. That is being uh, modeled in the body of Christ today as being a normal experience. I liken that to like a person. If you're saying that you're empty and that you're just so desperate and and there's no joy, there's no peace. Oh, God, where are you? I'm hungry. I'm desperate for you. If that's the way that you're using that, I liken that to like a person who is sitting in front, sitting at a table in front of a, you know, a 12-course meal, 
everything that they could ever want is there. And they're saying, oh, I'm so hungry. I'm hungry. And they're just wanting somebody to pity them or somebody to come stick the food in their mouth for them. I have no pity for a person that is sitting there in front of a feast and talking about how hungry they are and how desperate they are. If you're hungry, eat. See, God has already given us everything. There is a well of living water on the inside of every born-again believer And if we are hungry, then it is not God's fault. It is not time to ask God to come touch us. It's time for us to start taking, eating, drinking of what he's already given us. Now, I know that I may have already offended some people before I even get very far into this teaching because they take it that I'm saying, so you you say that there is no place for a Christian to ever have discouragement, despair, have any problems, that we should always be perfect. And you're talking about just denying reality and going by Uh, something else. No, I believe that Christians do experience hunger in the sense that you are empty, that it just seems like God's a million miles away. But what I'm trying to say is when you experience that, instead of going to God and saying, oh God, I just don't feel your love. Oh God, love me. Oh God, do something to show me that you love me. I think that is absolutely wrong. Because what that is doing is saying that, God, you haven't done anything, and you are looking at it, it's God's fault that you're feeling this hunger, this emptiness. What I'm saying is that when I experience that, because of this revelation God has given me, I know that God loves me infinitely, that that he can't love me anymore, that he can't give me any more love than what I've got. There are times... And by the grace of God, I can say this, that over the last 30-something years, I have not reached a place of depression and just wanting to quit and give up. Now, I've been tempted. I've had those feelings come at me. I've had some terrible things happen, and I'm not going to sit here and spend 30 minutes telling you how bad my life has been because that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm just saying that I've had issues just the same as anybody else, and I've had thoughts like, man, just get in your pickup and drive and don't come back. Walk away from this stuff. I can't stand it. I've had those thoughts. But because I also have this revelation that God already loves me, that God's already provided everything, when I feel this hunger, this discouragement, despair coming on, instead of giving in to it and saying, God, that's the way it is, now you've got to do something new to touch me. I'm looking for something new from you. To me, that is a insult against what God has already done. Instead, what I do is say, Father, this is absolutely wrong. John 6.35 says I should never hunger, I should never thirst again. I know that on the inside of me there is so much joy. There is love, joy, and peace. Galatians 5.22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Everything I need is already there. So, Father, I know that you've done your part. If I am tempted with depression, discouragement, giving up, quitting, then, Father, it's not your fault. It's my fault. I am not focused on you. I've let my eyes be taken off of you and put on the problems of this world. And so I just separate myself. I'll spend a day fasting and praying and seeking God. And what I'm doing, I'm just mining what's already in me. I'm drawing out the life that is already in me instead of asking God to give me something new. And because of that, I can truthfully say that over 33 years, I haven't been depressed. I've been tempted to be depressed. I've had feelings of depression start to hit me, but within 10 or 15 minutes, I just decide I don't like depression. And I don't have to have this because on the inside, God has given me such joy that I can rejoice at all times. That's what the scripture says. Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's not just telling you to do something, hoping that it'll that something will come if you'll start doing the right things. No, this is talking about draw out what's on the inside of you. And because of that, I have not given in to discouragement and depression, and I have lived a victorious life, and I have joy and peace, not because I'm not ever tempted to do the other, but because I know that God's already done his part. And instead of me having to become passive and just saying, God, I'm waiting on you, and then in between the time that you pray that prayer and some epiphany happens, you just languish. And you sing these songs about, I'm hungry, I'm desperate. Oh, God, where are you? Oh, God, it's so miserable down here. We're just a poor wayfaring pilgrim. Instead of doing that kind of stuff, I start saying, Father, 
I know that this isn't right. This isn't what you've done. Your word shows me that you've already blessed me. So I start praising God. I start focusing. I separate myself and I draw out this life. And because of it, I hadn't had discouragement or depression last in my life more than 10 or 15 minutes in 30 something years. And therefore, I say I haven't been discouraged or depressed. I haven't yielded to it. I haven't let it have its effect in my life. I don't know if you're getting that, but I tell you, that to me is awesome. There are so many people who desire those same results that I'm talking about, but the way they think you get there is to passively ask God to do something, and then you just sit back, and if you don't just instantly change, if victory doesn't come, if joy doesn't come, if healing, prosperity, blessings don't come, then you get upset with God. God, why aren't you doing anything? That's not my take at all. I know God's already done everything, and if I'm not seeing it manifest, it's not God who hasn't given, it's me who hasn't received. So let's go back over to the book of Ephesians, and the book of Ephesians is written from this perspective about what has already taken place, and I'm going to be reinforcing this and sharing this many, many times over. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice the terminology here. Blessed be God who hath, past tense, it's already been done, blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Now the terminology here in the King James is a little vague. I've had some people say before, well, this means that only in spiritual things, in an ethereal realm, not in practical, personal ways, but just in heavenly places have you been blessed. You know, I think it's the um, Living Bible. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly which translation it is, but it's either the Living Bible or the uh, Amplified Bible. One of those says, with all earthly and spiritual blessings and the way that they interpret this and the way I believe that this is saying, it's just old English here for saying that God has already blessed us with everything. It's already been done. It's in the spiritual realm. All, all that God has done for you has already been deposited in you, in your spirit. And you have to draw it out of the spirit into the physical and the emotional realm. But it's already there. And this verse is saying that it has already been done. Now, if God has already blessed you, then why are you asking God to bless you? Well, some people, well, you know, that's just semantics. That's no problem. No, it is a problem. You know, the reason people are praying and asking and seeking a blessing is because they don't believe they've already been blessed. You know, often when I'm ministering to a crowd, I'll take my Bible and I'll walk to a person on the front row and I'll give them my Bible. And then I'll say, now, what would I do if this person who's already got my Bible comes to me and says, can I have your Bible? How do you respond to a request like that? If somebody's asking you for something that they've already got, how do you respond? Well, you know what? Probably I just wouldn't know how to respond. I'd probably just look at them and think, well, you know, I'd think you've already got. What is he asking? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do that I haven't done? If you're asking for something that you've already got, how does the person you're asking respond to that? Probably they're just silence. Kind of sounds like the way God responds to us many times when we're saying, Oh, God, heal my body. And you just don't hear a thing. And you wonder, God, what's going on? Why haven't you answered my prayer? God's probably in heaven scratching his head and saying, Now, wait a minute. Doesn't First Peter 2.24 say that by my stripes you were healed? Past tense. It's already done. Right here in Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to share that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is already on the inside of you. I mean, if God could be confused, I believe God would be confused saying, I know I gave this to him. I know I did. And yet they're asking me for it. I tell you, that is not the way to approach God. We pray prayers like, God, we ask you to come and be with us in our church service today. Oh, God, just meet with us. Now, Don't get upset with me, but I'm just trying to get my point across. That is a stupid prayer. That is stupid. God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Why would you be praying, God, come and be with us today? Something's not right. 
God said he'd never leave us. He'll always be with us when two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of you. And yet we're saying, oh, God, come and be with us. You know what we're doing? We're letting our senses dominate us because we don't see God, because we don't feel anything, because nobody's jumped a pew yet. We are asking God to do something and asking him to come when the word says that he's already there. Now, here is an appropriate way to pray. The proper way to pray is to say, Father, thank you that your word promises you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So we thank you that you are here. And when two or three are gathered together in your name, there is a special presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that you're here. We believe it. And Father, we want it manifest. We don't want you to just be here in principle in the spirit realm, but we want to yield to you to the point that you can manifest yourself so that healings, deliverance, Joy and peace can come, salvation, baptism of the Holy Ghost. We want you to have freedom to manifest yourself and do what you want to do. Now, see, that's an appropriate way to pray, pray because you are praying in agreement with God's Word. You're saying, we believe your promises, but we want them to be manifest. We want you to come from the spirit world into physical manifestation. See, that's an appropriate way to pray. But to pray, oh God, come and be with us is an incorrect way to pray. And it means that a person doesn't believe that God is there until they can see it. And then when somebody begins to start shouting and, oh, man, I feel the Holy Ghost, then they say, oh, God's here. Well, he was there the whole time. It wasn't God that just showed up. It was you that just learned how to receive. You know, I can liken it to this. It's If you could use this illustration, it's like a person with a television set and radio and television waves. You know, wherever you are right now, doesn't matter where you are, if you are listening to this tape, there are television signals wherever you are. If you're in a house, if you're in a car, if you're at work, if you're out walking, jogging, whatever you're doing, there are television signals there. And you might say, oh, no, they aren't. Why? Because you can't see them. You can't hear them. That doesn't mean that they're there. Even in the physical realm, unbelievers, people with zero faith, can prove that there are television signals there because all you have to do is take a television set and plug it in, turn it on, tune it in, and when you see the signal, when you see the broadcast, is not when the station starts their broadcasting. The broadcasts are there before the television set is even in place, before it's turned on. But when you turn it on is when you start receiving, not when they start broadcasting. And if you have a problem with your television set, if, say, for instance, it went black all of a sudden, what would be your first reaction? It would not be to call the television station and to ask them to start broadcasting again because you know they quit broadcasting because you don't see a picture anymore. Now, see, you wouldn't do that. The first thing you do is check your receiver. You'd turn it to another station. And if other stations were coming on, but that one wasn't, well, then you might think that it's the station that's not broadcasting. They're having a problem with their transmitter. But if you, if your television was totally blank, no stations were coming in, then you wouldn't call the station. You'd say, you know what, it's my receiver that's the problem. The first thing you would check is your receiver. 99% of the time, it is not the station's transmitter that's the problem. It's your receiver. Now, see, you can use that same analogy and apply that to God. With God, he's the one that's got the transmitter. He's the one who's the giver of all earthly and spiritual blessings. Everything comes from God, but God has already transmitted. And if you aren't seeing it manifest in your life, it's not time for you to ask God to fix his transmitter. It's time for you to get your receiver fixed. It's time for you to get your television set worked on. Amen. And yet, see, what most Christians do is when they don't feel the joy of the Lord, they go to the Lord and they say, Oh, God, where's my joy? What's wrong? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Have any of you ever sung this song? That's actually, it's an Old Testament scripture where David prayed over in Psalms chapter 51. David is repenting of his sin with Bathsheba. And he says in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. In verse 10 it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now there's a very popular song, and again, I love that song. The tune's great. But you know what? It is an Old Testament prayer. For you to say, oh God, cast me not away from your presence. God, don't leave me. That's an insult against what Jesus came to do. David did not have a covenant that God would stick with him through thick and thin and through anything. The covenant in the old covenant was based on performance. And so God did come and go. The people in the Old Testament were not born again. They didn't have an eternal redemption the way that it's spoken of in the new covenant in Hebrews chapter 9. But in the new covenant, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you always. That is a covenant promise of the New Testament. And if you've been born again, and if you don't feel the presence of God, for you to pray this prayer that David prayed and say, cast me not away from your presence, renew a right spirit within me, take not your Holy Spirit from me. If you were to pray that prayer, it means, number one, that you don't understand what benefits you have in your covenant. Number two, it means you're in unbelief. You are not believing the new covenant. And you're praying in unbelief, and then you wonder why you aren't seeing better manifestation. I tell you what, you need to pray in faith. It's the prayer of faith that's going to save the sick. It's the prayer of faith that's going to bring you deliverance and joy. The right way to pray is to say, Father, I don't feel like you are here. Father, it seems like you've left me. Man, there's no indication in my life. Everything seems to have gone south. But, Father, your word says you'll never leave me nor forsake me, so I know that you're here. Whatever is causing these problems in my life, it's not you, and it's not you that's forsaken me. So, Father, I'm not going to pray the prayer of David and say, Don't leave me. Don't cast me away. Take not your Holy Spirit. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Father, I know it's already there. And I'm asking you now to just help me to see what I've done to turn away from this. Father, as I seek you, help me to make connection and release this life that's on the inside. I know your Holy Spirit's still here. I'm believing that it's going to be released. I know that you'll never leave me. And I know that your blessings are still here. And I'm refusing to have these things. See, that's praying a prayer of faith. Now, there's still a fight. But the fight is to stand in the victory that God has already purchased for you, not to go out and win a victory. Man, there's a difference between those two. You know, when I was in the army, it made a huge difference whether you were trying to defend a position that was already held or whether you were trying to go and take a position. Some of you may not relate to that, but you could take a hill and if you were on top of the hill and had that uh, advantage uh, of a defensive position, you could hold a hill with, say, five men, whereas it would take a hundred men to take that position. It's a lot more effort to go conquer something that you don't have than it is to defend something that you already have. You need to believe, like this scripture is saying in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 3, that you've already been blessed. God has already given you healing. He's already given you wisdom, revelation. He's already given you prosperity, joy, peace, everything that you will ever need. You know, right here, I could unplug and teach some other things. I haven't got time to do this, but let me recommend to you a four-tape series that I have on spirit, soul, and body. And this teaching will go in. It'll fit right here where we are. And it'll show you how that in your spirit, your spirit is as perfect, as complete, as full of the blessing of God and the power of God and the joy of God as it will ever be throughout all eternity. One third of your salvation is over. Your spirit is completely saved. It's identical to Jesus. It has his joy, his peace, his knowledge, his love. His fruit, everything that is true of Jesus is true of your born-again spirit. There is no inadequacy. And your spirit is not in the process of growing up into these things. It's not like all of the things that Jesus has are in your spirit in seed form, but they have to grow. No, they are complete and full-grown in the spirit. And all you've got to do is renew your mind and let these things manifest themselves through you. Now, that is a wonderful truth. And like I said, I've got four tapes. That's about six hours worth of teaching that will explain that in detail on this series entitled Spirit, Soul, and Body. 
And if that's not a revelation to you, you need that to fully understand what I'm saying. But see, God has already done it. This isn't just in principle. It's not just written down on a piece of paper someplace. There is an actual transformation that took place in your spirit. And you have love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's what Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says. You are identical to Jesus. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And just so many other scriptures. These things have already been done. You've already got the same power that raised Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. And if you would start believing that you already have it, it is infinitely easier to release something that you already have than it is to try and go get something that you don't believe that you have. See, if you aren't absolutely convinced that you've already got it, then you will submit or you will have to battle thoughts that you won't get it. But once you know that you've already got it, how can you doubt that you'll get it? Man, that is so simple, it's profound. When my wife and I first got started in the ministry, we were so poor we couldn't pay attention. I mean, we struggled financially, and there were reasons for that. You know, God had already blessed us with financial prosperity, but I didn't know the laws of prosperity. I wasn't cooperating with them. Actually, I was violating a number of instructions in the Word of God, and because of that, until I learned some things, we had some financial problems. Now, I was believing God with all that I knew, and because God loved me, I didn't starve. He kept us from starving to death, but, boy, we didn't prosper the way that we should until we began to learn how the kingdom operate and cooperate with it. But during that period of time, when I first started pastoring a church in Seagaville, Texas, I didn't even have a Bible that was complete. The Bible that I had was the Bible that I'd taken through Vietnam with me, and, I mean, that thing was beat up. And uh, I had marked in it so much you couldn't read most passages. And there was entire books of the Bible that had fallen out. I'd lost it. I didn't even have a full Bible. So here I was pastoring a little church in Seagaville, Texas, and I didn't even have a full Bible. And I just made a decision. I don't know if I was right or wrong, but this is what I did. I just said, Father, you know, somewhere I've got to start seeing the power of God in manifestation. And if I can't believe you for enough money to get a new Bible, well, then how am I going to believe God for enough money to lead people into salvation and see them healed and delivered and baptized in the Holy Ghost? I just made an issue out of this, and I said, God, this faith either works, and I am going to see a manifestation of me getting a new Bible, or I'm going to die Right here. I'm either going to win or lose. Whether I win or lose, this battle about getting a new Bible determines whether I'm going on. I, this was non-negotiable with me. And so anyway, I started believing God for a new Bible. And it took me six months to get enough money to go buy a Bible. Now, some of you will struggle with this, and you'll think that I just had misplaced priorities and that I wasn't giving getting the Bible a very high priority, but... That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, my wife and I would go two and three weeks without food, even when she was eight months pregnant, because, I mean, we just didn't have it. When I say that it took me six months to believe for about $25 extra to go get a Bible, I am not exaggerating. Some people, when they say that they're having trouble, it means that they have $1,000 in the bank, but they have $1,100 worth of bills. We didn't even have a bank account. We didn't even have any money. I mean, there was days that we'd go without a penny in our pocket. I, I picked up Coke bottles to get gas money and do things. So anyway, my point is that during that six-month period of time, I had Satan just plague me. I fought doubt constantly. There was probably not over a 10-minute period of time during my waking hours for six months that I didn't have some thought that was like, it's not going to work. You'll never get it. You don't even have a Bible. Some man of God you are. I'd have to throw down those thoughts and say, no, in the name of Jesus, I do have my Bible. And I had to fight those thoughts. I mean, it was constant. It was unrelenting for six months. But, you know, after I finally got enough money, I went to a bookstore. I bought a Bible. I had my name engraved on it. It was mine. And when I walked out with that Bible under my arm, guess what? I never doubted 
one more time that I would get it. Once I had it, I never doubted that I'd get it. And some of you are thinking, well, of course you. Well, why would you doubt that you'd get something that you've already got? That's exactly my point. You know why you pray and say, oh, God, I ask you to heal me. And then right after that, you have to say, you have to counter this thought about you're going to die. The do- and you think about what the doctor said, and you have to start dealing with those thoughts of unbelief. And you know why you're having those thoughts of unbelief? Because you don't believe you've already been healed. You believe God can heal you, but you are waiting on God to heal you. That is wrong. God has already released his healing power. You are not waiting on God to heal you. God is waiting on you to appropriate what he has already done. It's like that television signal. The signal's already being broadcast. If you aren't seeing the picture, it's not God who's not broadcasting. It's your receiver who isn't working right. And you have to tweak it. You need to get into the owner's manual the Word of God, and start studying and find out how to turn that thing on, how to tune it, how to eliminate the static and how to deal with things, how to get the best signal. That's what the owner's manual, the Bible, is all about. And see, if you would adopt this attitude instead of saying, oh God, the doctor says I'm going to die. Oh God, please heal me. And then you just, somebody says, how are you? Well, I'm waiting on God. No, that's not the way it works. You aren't waiting on God. By His stripes, you were healed, 1 Peter 2, 24. God is waiting on you to believe and to receive. You know, since I've been teaching on this and trying to get this point across, more people than ever are seeing what I'm talking about. And one of the results is that I have seen more people healed in probably the last year of me teaching on this than I've seen in the last two or three years combined. I mean, I've seen an increase of healing because people are no longer just asking and waiting on God to do it, but instead they are believing that God has done it and they are taking their authority and beginning to command the healing of God that has already been provided to come into manifestation. There is a world of difference between those two. I remember a time that my oldest son Joshua got sick And it's a long story, but he got sick, and I mean, it looked like he was going to die. Jamie and I fought that, stood against it, and finally he got better. And this happened a number of years in a row, and finally one time I saw this coming back on him, and I began to pray and say, God, what's wrong? And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, the problem is that you are fighting to get healed instead of fighting because you have been healed. In other words, you are trying to obtain healing instead of defend the healing that you already have. Again, I say that this has to be a revelation to you. Some of you that may not have, it may not have touched your heart and done what it was intended to do. But if you could get a revelation of what I said right there, it would make a huge difference. Instead of fighting to get healed, fight because you have been healed. Instead of fighting, trying to obtain healing, Fight and defend the healing that was already purchased for you in the Lord. And if you can get that attitude, it will change your life. Let me go on and read. Man, I could just explain this and make applications forever. This is a truth that uh, just permeates everything that we do with the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, Did you know when you cried out to the Lord is not when the Lord said his desire upon you and all of a sudden said, okay, I I think I will respond and I'm going to send my son. No, he had already chosen you. The provision for your salvation had already been made. Salvation was already an accomplished work. It was just waiting for you. And all you had to do was reach out and receive. Believe and receive or doubt and do without. It was your choice. But God had already made the provision before you ever had the need. Before you were ever born, before you ever sinned, God had already meant this. He had chosen you before the foundation of the world that you should be holy and without blame before him in love. In verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath, past tense, made us accepted in the Beloved. You know, most Christians are fighting and trying to live holy and 
reading the word and doing things, trying to make themselves acceptable unto God so that God will accept them. It's like they're on a treadmill with a carriage, you know, on a stick tied to their back, hanging out in front of them, and they're reaching for it, and they're moving towards it, but they're never getting anywhere. Every time they move, the goal moves. There's a lot of Christians that are looking for a time that they are going to be accepted with God. What you need to do is to recognize that he hath already made you accepted in the beloved. Did you know that in the Greek, the word that was used here for accepted in the beloved is exactly the same word that was translated highly favored over in Luke chapter 1 or chapter 2 where the angel Gabriel appeared unto Mary and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. That's the exact same word. These are the only two times that word is used in the New Testament. And so when this is saying that you have been made accepted, it means that you are highly favored by God. Man, that's awesome. Do you know most people don't believe that's already an accomplished fact? That's something that they're longing for and hoping will happen. But the truth is, God loves you so much, he couldn't love you anymore. There's nothing you could do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. See, that goes contrary to most religious teachings. Most religion today tells you that God loves you proportional to your performance. That is not true. You are accepted because of what Jesus has done. You are accepted in the beloved. That's talking about Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Man, I could spend an hour or two on that. You have already got forgiveness, not only for the past sins that you've confessed, but for past, present, and even future tense sins were all dealt with and all paid for. Man, that probably made some people choke right there. I've probably got 40 tapes that deal with that one thing. All talking about, I've got a tape entitled Eternal Redemption that will deal with that out of Hebrews chapter 9. Let me drop on down to the uh, 14th verse or the 15th verse of this first chapter just because I'm running out of time. In Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 15, Paul begins to pray a prayer. Now, before we get into this prayer, let me ask you a question. If you were asked to write a prayer that people 2,000 years from now would be reading and it would benefit them, how would you pray? Well, I can tell you based on my experience dealing with thousands and thousands of people, the average person would pray a prayer, something like, Oh God, we ask you to just pour your spirit out on this generation. Oh God, send revival on these people. Oh God, move in a mighty way. Oh God, do a new work, do a new thing. All of the prayer would be about God, you do something. Paul is praying just the opposite. Notice how his prayer is. Basically, it's God, show them what you've already done. Lord, help them to understand what you have done. There's a huge difference between those two. When we pray and intercede for other people, we're praying, oh God, go and touch this person instead of, oh God, help them to see what you've already done. There's a huge difference between those two. And I tell you, the the difference that it'll make in your life too, it'll give you a confidence when you begin to know that God's already done it. The people that you're interceding for, God loves them more than you do. It is not your prayer that is making God love them and move in their life. God loves them millions of times more than you possibly could. We can't even approach the love that God has for the people you're interceding for. And yet how many times have you prayed for somebody and you felt like, God, if you love this person half as much as I do, you would touch their life. I actually found myself praying that about 30 years ago. I was praying for a revival in Arlington, Texas. And I literally got so intent, I was crying, weeping and wailing and begging and pleading again, thinking that God had to do something to send revival. And because of that, I caught myself one time praying, and I was so intense, I finally cried out and I said, God, if you love the people of Arlington, Texas, half as much as I do, there'd be revival. And man, as soon as I said that, I knew something was wrong. See, my thought was that 
God was responding to my prayer and that my prayer was moving God and motivating God and that God, in a sense, was in heaven with his arms folded and he was upset with us because of how ungodly we were and he had withdrawn his spirit, he had withdrawn his blessings and we had to plead with him and turn his heart back towards us. There's a lot of people that they believe that that's the way that it is, praying for a revival. And that's absolutely wrong. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I am for revival. I am for the benefits of revival. I just disagree on how you get there. The way you get revival isn't by begging God to pour out his spirit and send revival and pleading with God to do a new thing and to move. Rather, the way you get revival is by starting to believe what God has already done. And you start walking in this dynamic life that God has given us. You go out and raise somebody from the dead. You open up blind eyes. You start ministering to people and seeing them set free, and you'll have all the revival that you can handle. If you start flowing in the power of God, they'll start breaking holes in the roof to let the people down and so that you can be healed as they did with Jesus. Jesus didn't come asking God to pour out his spirit. God poured out his spirit in Jesus, and Jesus just started dipping it out, drawing it out, and releasing it, and giving it towards people. And I guarantee you, anything you want to call revival happened in the ministry of Jesus, and it didn't happen by him pleading for God to do something. It happened by him coming and doing what God told him to do. Yes, we need revival in our nation, but how do we get it? by getting another million people to agree together and fast and pray one day a week and ask God for it? No, that's not how revival comes. Revival comes by us seeking God with our whole heart and beginning to believe what he has already done, draw it out, flow in it, and I guarantee you, people if you'll catch on fire for God, people will come watch you burn. That's the way that it works. And so here's the way that Paul prayed this prayer in verse 15. He didn't pray that God would do something new, but instead he says, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you what? Oh, give unto you a new thing, a new outpouring. Man, there's coming a new wave. No. He says that he'd just give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Actually, if I had time, I could go back and show you that it says in verse 8 of this same chapter that he has already abounded towards us in all wisdom and in all prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, etc. In other words, this revelation that Paul is praying for is actually already given to every believer. It's just that not every believer has their set plugged in, turned on, and tuned in. We aren't all receiving it. And so he's not even asking for God to do something new, but rather he's praying that what God has already done, the revelation that God has already placed on the inside of us would just begin to come out. Praying that God would open up the eyes of our understanding in verse 18, being enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Man, what a radical statement. If I had time, I could take every one of these phrases and just break them down and reestablish this truth that I've been making. Notice in verse 18, he says, The eyes of your understanding enlightened. In other words, you don't need God to do something new. What you need to do is get an understanding. You need to see and understand what God has already done. You are already more than a conqueror through Christ. Any person listening to this tape who's already born again has already been transformed and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. You have the same power, the same life, the same wisdom, the same victory, the same anointing, the same faith that Jesus had. You don't need more faith. That's going to be one of the tapes in this series. We'll be dealing with that. You don't need more of anything. What you need is a revelation of what you already have. And that's what he's praying, that your eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling, that you would get a full revelation of exactly the, what your potential is, is what he's praying right here. And that you would see what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Do you know most people, when they think about the glory of God and they want to picture the glory of God, they start imagining heaven 
and streets of gold and mansions and glory and splendor and pearls, gates made out of one pearl and foundation stones and all of these kind of things. And yet, did you know what this verse is saying is that the riches of the glory of God's inheritance is in the saints. It's not in heaven. The things in heaven would pale in comparison to what is already on the inside of you. Many of you are just thinking right now, this can't be. And why do you feel that way? Well, because you go look in a mirror and you see gray hairs, zits, bulges, ugliness, red eyes, or whatever the situation is. And you think, man, this can't be what God's glory is. And then you search your emotional realm and you don't feel joy and you don't feel peace and you don't feel awesome. And so you say, man, it isn't there. But there is a third part of you, the spirit that most people don't really have any revelation of. And you can't get a revelation of it through your five senses. You can't just feel what you have in the Spirit. You have to see it through the Word and then believe it by faith. And it's in the Spirit realm where this is true. The glory of God is in your spirit. What you have in your spirit would bankrupt heaven if it had to be traded. I tell you what, it couldn't be replaced. The glory of God is already on the inside of you, and most of us don't know it. If a person had a revelation of this, how could you be depressed if you really knew what was the hope of your calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the inside of you right now? You can't be depressed thinking on those things. Instead, you have to shut that off and just put blinders on and look in the physical realm and look at your physical circumstances and see all the negative things. But if you get into who you are in Christ and what you have and just go to recognizing that these things are already done, it's a done deal, it's a finished work, that the glory that you will experience throughout all eternity is already on the inside of you. If you got a revelation of that, that would put a shout in a fence post. That would make you begin to start having victory. And then in verse 19, he says, and he wants you to understand what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Man, what powerful, powerful scriptures. This is saying in verse 19, he wants you to see the exceeding greatness of his power to ward us who believe. It's the same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. How many times have you or somebody else you've heard pray and say, Oh God, we just need more power. Where's God going to get any more power? He says here that you have the same power that was used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, that's the greatest manifestation of the power of God that has ever been. If you could somehow or another put the power of God on some kind of a meter, like one of these VU meters, you know, that shows how much power is released... I can guarantee you that when Jesus was raised from the dead, that power indicator pegged out. It was over to the max. I believe that raising Jesus from the dead was a greater manifestation of the power of God than the creation of the world and the universe than anything else that had ever happened. Satan and all of his demons were marshaled against raising Jesus from the dead. He threw everything he had, every bit of his power went against Jesus coming back from the dead. And yet it didn't work. You know, the church that I go to, they put on a Christmas pageant. It's an elaborate deal. It's a very large church and they do it in a great way. And one time they, in an Easter pageant, they portrayed Satan as a person. They had a person dressed up as the devil who was on the Mount of Trans, uh, Temptation, uh, you know, heckling Jesus. This person who was supposed to be the devil showed up in the crowd when they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. And then at the resurrection, they had a tomb and a big uh, stone rolled over it. And the way they portrayed the resurrection, they had Satan and all of his demons standing there pushing against this stone, trying to keep it from being open. 
And yet, all of a sudden, there was an explosion, and there was smoke, and and this uh, stone came out, and it and it fell on top of the devil. He was laying underneath it, and then Jesus walked out of the tomb and stood on top of the stone. Now, that's not literally the way it happened, but spiritually, symbolically, you know, that is true, that Satan was there doing everything he could, and yet his power was nothing for the power of God. The resurrection power of Jesus is the greatest demonstration of God's power that has ever existed. And this scripture is saying that you have that raising from the dead power on the inside of you. It's not out there in heaven someplace. It's inside of you. You don't need more power. What you need to do is believe that you have that power and begin to find out how it operates. What are the laws that govern how it works and begin to put it into practice. Man, if you could get a revelation of what I'm saying, it would change your prayer. As I said in the very beginning of this teaching, it would ruin you. It really would. Because it would just make you incompatible, incompatible with so much of religious traditions today where they are begging God and they're saying, Oh God, we are nothing. We have nothing. But we believe you can do anything. God, come and move. You know what? That is not the New Testament attitude. The New Testament attitude is that God in myself, I'm nothing. I don't have any virtue or worth just based on my human ability, but my covenant with you, I'm now a new creature. And on the inside of me, I have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And you said whatever I lay my hands on is going to be healed. And you get up and you take authority and you begin to start commanding and releasing the power of God. See, that's the New Testament authority. In the third chapter of the book of Acts, you can read about where Peter and John went into the temple and they saw this lame man there. And they looked on him and then they said, Such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they reached down and grabbed the man by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. They said, Such as I have. Now, it wasn't their power. It wasn't human power. But they were talking about because they are born again, they have this raising from the dead power on the inside of them. And they said, such as I have. Did you know a statement like that will get you kicked out of most charismatic, spirit-filled churches today? They don't understand that. They would sit there and say, oh, you can't do anything. It's not you. Well, of course, it's not me and my physical self, but it is me. My born again me has been given the resurrection life of God. Man, that's awesome. That is awesome. And if you could understand that, you know what? It'll change the way you pray. No longer will you be praying and saying, oh, God, the doctor says I'm going to die. God, I can't do anything. Oh, God, please heal me. Oh, God, please touch me. And you're just sitting there as a helpless nothing. And you're begging God to do something. You know what? A person who's praying that way does not have a revelation that they have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of them. I tell you what, if you get a revelation of this, it'll it'll change you from being a murmurer and a complainer and a whiner and griper into a person who believes and takes your authority and stands and fight and demands that Satan is not going to steal from you what God has given you totally different attitude. There is a total different attitude of a person who is petrified and hiding in a corner and praying, oh, devil, please don't bother me. Please, God, get the devil off my back. There's a total different attitude of that and a person who's standing there saying, where is he? Man, I just dare the devil. I'm going to fight the devil until the death. Man, I've got authority and power. There's a huge difference, not only emotionally, but there's a huge difference in the results that come out of something like that. And I tell you, most Christians today are whiners, grippers, complainers, beggars, instead of commanders, taking what Jesus has already done. You know, just as this prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, you need to take this prayer and you need to start praying and saying, God, I got a glimpse of this, but oh, I need a revelation. Father, open up the eyes of my understanding. Help me to see the hope of a calling. Help me to see the riches of the glory 
that you have put on the inside of me. Help me to see the exceeding greatness of your power that has been given unto me, the same power that was used to raise Jesus from the dead, to conquer all of the principalities and powers. Oh, Father, give me revelation of what I've already got. That ought to be the prayer of the saints instead of saying, Oh, God, give me more than what I've got. God, I don't have enough. Oh, God, I know you can do anything, but I can do nothing. Well, it is true that in myself, my carnal self, my flesh part of me, apart from the born again part of me, there is no good thing. And I can do nothing by myself. But you know what? I am not only carnal. There is a part of me that has been born again and that now has the life and the victory and the power deposited on the inside of it. And I am in my spirit right this moment as Jesus is. I am in my spirit right this moment the same way that I'll be throughout all eternity. I don't need something new. I don't need God to do something new. What I need is a revelation of what has already been done. There's three parts to me, spirit, soul, and body. And it's a simple majority. My spirit is exactly like Jesus. It's always for God. And if my soul, which is my mental, emotional part of me, gets renewed and gets into faith and gets to believing what is in my spirit, then that's two against one. That's spirit and soul against the body. And I can guarantee you the body will have to respond. Simple majority. But on the other hand, if your soul gets into agreement with your physical body and says, no, I don't have anything. If I had the power of God, if I had the resurrection power of God on the inside of me, I could feel it. Well, if you're going to go by feelings, if you're going to let your sense knowledge dominate you, if you're going to go only by what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, then that's the soul in agreement with the body, and you will shut off the power and the life that is in your resurrected spirit. Romans chapter 8 And I believe it's verse 17, could be verse 18, but it says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It didn't say the glory which shall be revealed to us, but rather in us. When we get to heaven, it's not going to be like all of a sudden, man, there's going to be the glory of God and it's going to be imparted unto us and then we're going to be something. What's going to happen is, is when we get to heaven, we are no longer going to think carnally we will see what was already in us. And you know what? This is the reason that God's going to have to wipe tears away from our eyes. It's not because everybody's going to barely limp into heaven and just barely get there. No, it's going to be because when we do get there and we have a full revelation of what we already had, I believe there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth over the way that we let the devil steal from us. We were intimidated. We begged and pleaded for God to do something, not believing that he had already done it. We lived below our privileges. We let the devil beat up on us when there was no reason for it. And because of it, there's going to be weeping and wailing, and God's going to have to supernaturally comfort us to enable us to enjoy heaven. Man, these are some strong things that I'm saying. But this is a total different mindset. And I I meet people all of the time who are so depressed and are so defeated and so discouraged that they take offense at what I'm saying. They think that I'm not compassionate. They think that I'm just being insensitive and you don't understand what it's like to hurt. Again, I'm not going to sit here and glorify the devil by talking about all my problems, but I've had things that hurt me so bad that I honestly thought I couldn't live through the night, that I'd never make it. I believe I've hurt just about as deeply as anybody. It's different. You can sit there and argue yours is worse than mine. But the point is, I've I've experienced things that are beyond my ability to cope with. And to me, what I'm sharing here is what has brought me out of that despondency and discouragement. We've got a touchy-feely, feel-good uh, philosophy in this world today that has permeated even Christians. And there's a lot of people that would rather sit there and feel the pain and have people pity them and put their arms around them and feel that little bit of comfort and that pat on the back and, oh, man, it really is miserable. There's some people that would look for that more than they would look for an answer that would draw them out of that. To me, what I'm sharing is not insensitive, but to me it's the answer. It's the truth, and the truth will set you free. John chapter 8, verse 32. 
It's only the truth that you know that will set you free. I'm not trying to be insensitive. I understand that people have problems and that not everybody believes perfectly and always operates in this. And so I can have pity on a person who has fallen into a problem. But when you hear this truth, the right response should be, Father, that is true. And you know what? It's already there. And I'm going to get up. And in the name of Jesus, I'm going to believe God, appropriate what is rightfully mine. And I'm coming out of this stuff. That's the right reaction. Those of you that would sit there and just want to keep hurting and know you want people's pity and you want to just keep hurting and have people pity you the rest of your life and get that little, you know, sad look on your face. I I just don't agree with that at all. And I am being hard on you because you know what? You need to pull your thumb out of your mouth and you need to grow up and you need to start recognizing what Jesus has already done for you. And I'm not. My, it's not my purpose to offend anybody. It's my purpose to help people with this. But I know that this is so contrary to our passive Christianity that we have today that there's a lot of people that will resist this and fight against it. And uh, I'm sorry about that, but I'm not going to change because it's setting me free. I tell you what, I have walked in a level of victory that may not be the greatest victory in the whole world of all people that have ever lived, But I have done things that are far beyond my human ability. I have walked in joy and peace. I haven't been depressed, defeated, discouraged in 30-something years. I've seen people raised from the dead. Even this very year, I've seen people raised from the dead, blind eyes open. I've been able to do things that are certainly not me. It's God's power on the inside of me. And I know that what I'm preaching works. It's what keeps me stable. It's what keeps me going when everything around me begins to look like it's falling apart. So don't wake me up. It's working for me. And I'm offering this to you. And I believe that if you could get this revelation, it'll work for you. I encourage you to just take this prayer. There's also a prayer in the third chapter of the book of Ephesians where he prays that you would understand the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love of God. Just get a revelation of how much God loves you, what God has done. If you would take these prayers out of Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3, and if you would pray those prayers and pray them and pray them and pray them, not to get God to do something, but rather just to open up the eyes of your understanding, then I can guarantee you God wants you to know this and to have a revelation of this more than you want to know it. And if you will open up and begin to start seeking and get hungry in a good way, in a positive way, to where, God, I can't live any longer without a revelation of what you've already done. I refuse to live any longer asking and begging and pleading for you to do what you've already done. I've got to have this revelation. When you get to where you seek with all of your heart, revelation of this will come to you. And it will change your life. This is not the kind of thing you get a revelation one time and then you never have to go back and revisit it. It's the kind of thing that needs to become a part of you every day of your life. The rest of this teaching, this entire series, will just begin to expand on this and expound on it to a greater degree, and I believe it will help you. But ultimately, you just need the Holy Spirit to make it real to you. It needs to go beyond just intellectual knowledge, and it needs to become a revelation knowledge direct from God and I agree with you and pray that God will use these things that I've said and open up your heart and help this to become a revelation to you that you've already got it